so welcome everybody. My name is Toby Frost. Thanks for stopping in for this month's threat of the month. And I'm going to talk about a scenario that we had uh, a few weeks ago in Lafayette, Indiana. We had a house blow up and it we went down a whole avenue of what's going on, what's what's the actual threat. Uh, to be perfectly frank, the initial dispatch, we all assumed it was a natural gas explosion. And so as the crews arrived on scene, what they saw was this house, the windows are blown out, uh, and, but there was no fire. There was a little bit of smoke coming. The initial entry team did an entry through the left-hand side, through the uh, Bravo side of the building. And as they stepped in the building, they immediately went into the basement. The door was blown off the basement. This is the entry to the basement, and you can see the doors blown, blown off the hinges. Uh, they reported a little bit of light smoke, but no fire. As they got started to go down the stairs, they encountered the victim, and he was at the bottom of the stairs at this point. And so they quickly grabbed the victim, pulled him out. Uh, reporting crews at arrival said they smelled sulfur. And so immediately people started thinking, well, maybe this isn't natural gas. No fire, nothing to indicate anything else was going on. No, the furnace had a little bit of fire in itself, which we later figured out was the wiring and some damage, but not uh, nothing to do with the natural gas. So as the crews went down to investigate and look for extension, this is what the blast room looked like. And so what you're looking at here is his workbench, uh, where the victim was when the explosion happened. It's been completely destroyed. And I want you to pay special attention to that five gallon bucket, because that's going to be what really kind of threw us in a little bit of a tizzy as far as what's going on. So as the crews were investigating, at our arrival, the victim was speaking. Uh, severe damage, he took the blast right to the chest and torso. Uh, and in the midst of getting to the hospital, he full coded. And uh, before the ambulance even left the scene, uh, he, he was deceased. So very little information from the victim. Law enforcement told us as, as we were investigating the scene, trying to figure out what's going on in the first couple minutes, that he was known to make homemade fireworks. And so again, that caused more, more everybody to slow down a little bit, try to figure out what's going on. And as we looked around the room, there was some damaged equipment laying on the floor from the, the blast, but here's our bucket. And so the crews reported that we had a bucket with an oxidizer placard on there. That's exactly how it was found. And we decided to do some sampling. No other idea what's going on at this point. Victim can't tell us. And our first instrument that they took was the MX-908. So we used the MX-908 for a sample swab. The first sample came back. They sampled the top of the plastic bag. They didn't open the bag. And it came back methamphetamine. But as you look around the room, there really is nothing else to suggest that we have a methamphetamine lab. None of the typical equipment we would see none of the chemicals we would expect to see. And so they took a second sample and the second sample said HMTD. And so if that bucket's full of HMTD, we have a very volatile situation. So everything slowed down at this point. Our fire marshal uh, made a quick phone call to somebody he knew in the ATF and said, hey, we suspect homemade fireworks. However, we don't really know what's going on is this something you're interested in? ATF agent said, yes, I definitely interested, but I'm about an hour away. So I'll start heading that direction. But why don't you call the FBI while I'm en route and why we try to figure out what's going on? So at this point, uh, we told him we had a positive hit for HMTD. And he said, ask that everyone just stay out of the building at this point. We had taken actually five sample swabs when they went in and the other three swabs all came back as no target detected. So I had a positive hit for methamphetamine. I had a positive hit for HMTD. Only, only instrument we've used at this point in the scenario is the MX-908. And so we slowed down, waited for ATF to get there and the FBI. And uh, the ATF agent said all his equipment was two hours away on a different call. 
And that's why he had asked us to call the FBI. And it kind of highlights the importance of working with your partners, knowing what kind of tools your partners have uh, so that you know who to call for when you need more assistance. So the FBI agent bought a Ramon device. And so the next thing we wanted to do was sample that white powder. So the bomb squad at this point made entry. And uh, we noticed this blue bucket up against the post that was burned up, but that was never sampled. And so when they made entry with this information, we have a, a possible hit for methamphetamine. We have a second hit for HMTD, no other targets detected. And we started doing some research on the guy. And so this was on his Facebook page. And the house that blew up was not his primary residence. And so if we go back and look at the basement for a second, they were in the middle of remodeling this house. And you can see the walls, the paint was not peeling prior to the blast. So literally the block basement wall was blown out in places. The cracks were all new. The floor joists had been lifted up off the foundation and laid down sideways. So the first floor was unstable at this point. So a lot of damage, uh, but not a lot of product. We have the five gallon bucket full and we have the blue bucket with nothing in it, but obviously something in there burned or damaged the bucket. So online on his Facebook page, uh, this was his home. Um, he had a picture, a video of him making homemade mortars. Uh, so commercial size fireworks, and he was just doing it at his kitchen table. So at this point, law enforcement reached out to the wife and asked, did she have any idea what he was doing? And she said, yes, I was there 15 minutes prior to this happening, and he was making homemade fireworks. He was mixing them. And we asked her what he was making. Did she know? And she really didn't know anything about the process, just that he said he had one more batch to do, and then he would be coming home. So law enforcement bomb squad made entry. We sampled with the Ramon device, and now we got identified potassium perchlorate. So we're in a little bit of a dilemma right now. We have a positive hit for HMTD. We have a positive hit for methamphetamine, and we have a positive hit for uh, potassium perchlorate. So what's really going on? We did a little bit of old fashioned chemistry. Uh, the bomb squad did a burn test and so we pretty confidently eliminated hmtd at this point but it really highlights the need that you can't rely on a single answer when we got the positive hit for hmtd the atf agent said if that bucket's really hmtd we're going to blow it up in place we are not removing the bucket we're not dealing with it we're going to sandbag the bucket and we're going to blow it up in place and so as everybody can imagine, that really slows things down. So now we've got to get utilities shut off to the building. We've got to evacuate the neighborhood. As a precaution, we had already started evacuating all the adjoining homes uh, when we got the positive hit for HMTD. But now we were trying to figure out the blast radius, how far to evacuate. We had to get the, reached out to the mayor. We wanted to get permission that if this was the action we were going to take, uh, it's a federal scene at this point. We're still operating on the possibility this could be HMEs. Uh, so ATF is really taking the lead at this point. Nothing to indicate anything that was nefarious, so it really wasn't falling in the realm of the FBI, but he was supporting us with equipment. So that's where their arm Ramon detector came from. They served a search warrant on his house while all this is going on. And the bomb squad showed up at his house, and this is walking down his basement stairs. And so, again, everything slowed down for a second. If you look on the basement stairs, we've got some lighter fluid, some alcohol, and a jar full of BBs. So the possibility that maybe he was making something besides fireworks came up again, because that was kind of questionable. As they proceeded down into the basement of the home where his family lived, this is what the basement looked like. And so you can see bags of oxidizers, bags of different material, and it was just kind of stacked all over the basement. And so as you're looking around the room, use your, you can see the TV as kind of a reference point. It kind of gives you an idea what was all down in the basement, some storage. But in the totes in the center of the screen, 
those were all fireworking fireworks making materials. So we had fuses, we had different chemicals in there. You had your shells and your containers. Lots of bulk product there. Uh, we have no idea. We have not yet sampled this white powder, but we had a bucket full of white powder in the basement, not labeled. Some of the stuff he did a pretty good job of labeling. Uh, some of the stuff he didn't. The orange bucket on the cart was full of pulverized charcoal. The totes were full of various chemicals in small quantities, one and two pound bags, five pound bags. This was everything stacked against the wall. So we had tubes of fuses. We had other material we had in the orange bucket. We've got different metals. So we've got aluminum uh, and, and several other metals that were used for making the fireworks. We had 85 pounds of potassium perchlorate in commercial packaging in the basement, along with other containers that, that he had repackaged stuff in. In addition to all of the homemade fireworks, he had in the corner of the basement a whole bunch of consumer fireworks. And it was roughly a 10 by 10 by eight foot tall pile of commercial grade fireworks. And what I thought was kind of interesting is if you notice the toy rack, right in front of all the stored material where his children's toys were. There's more of the commercial fireworks all stacked up in the corner. So this is all in the basement of the home he he occupies. So we have two, two properties at this point. We have his primary residence and the house that actually exploded and they were a couple miles apart. So we're running two scenarios. So the bomb squad entered his home uh, with the wife's permission and they started to pull out some of this uh, the chemicals and the unidentified products. So the challenge now became, we ended up pulling out approximately 300 pounds of chemical from his home. The follow-up investigation at the house, uh, which took, this incident started about one o'clock in the afternoon. We finished about 11 p.m when we were able to eliminate the HMT was HMTD was a false positive. The methamphetamine came from, it turns out that house had been a meth lab house. So when the gentleman bought it and he was rehabbing it, uh, we simply got trace residue from the previous meth lab. So that's where the meth lab sample came from most likely, uh, or the meth sample. So it wasn't inaccurate. But again, as we start looking at the size up of what we saw in the basement, there really was nothing to indicate a meth lab. We didn't have any of the precursors there. The explosion, if it had been a meth lab, we would have expected a lot more fire from the organic solvent, and we didn't see any of that. And then the explosion, uh, now we have a, not only do we have an explosion, now we have a deceased victim involved in it as well. So we then took all the chemicals out to the bomb range. And we started to go through, try to identify what the products were, what products could be safely handled, what products had to be uh, burned or blown up in place and how to deal with that. And so our dilemma was initially we had one piece of equipment on scene, the MX-908, and we didn't have anything else to back that up. Once we got the Ramon there, we got a different answer. So we had three different answers. The last sample taken was with an FTIR. And so we now had the Ramon and the FTIR both giving us the potassium perchlorate result. 908, we did hit reach back and they looked at the spectrum and said it's a close enough match that we cannot eliminate the possibility that it could be HMTD. And so when we reached out to a couple subject matter experts, uh, they said chemically that makes sense that it's going to ionize in a similar fashion. And so the false positive that we got from the 908 actually made sense once we knew what that final chemical was. But it kind of come, brings us back to this whole idea that we didn't have all the instrumentation on scene, but by reaching out to our partners, starting out with the phone call to the ATF, the ATF agent said called the FBI, and both of them responded to the scene, and we were able to bring these overlaying technologies to get that answer. And so the learning point here are a couple. Number one, we can't take action on a single piece of technology. It really doesn't matter what technology you have. They all have false positives at the end of the day. 
They all have weak points. There's no magic bullet that will give you every single answer under the sun. So needing to have that overlaying technology, knowing who to call in the midst of the event. If we hadn't had that contact of the ATF, we would have, it would have taken us longer to, the next resource we had was about two hours away. So waiting for the equipment, we would have an additional two hours delay while we were trying to manage this and figure out what's really going on. And so that was our challenge as we worked through all this. All said and done from start to finish, it was about an eight hour scenario because I mean, I kind of walked you through it quickly, but once we hit that HMTD, we were waiting on the ATF and the bomb squad. And the bomb squad said at that point, if it's HMTD, they're waiting for the ATF. This is this was federal at that point, and they weren't going to take any more action. Another thing I learned, I never knew so much about fireworks before this event. I've been doing a lot of research because of the over the 30 different chemicals we pulled out of the house. And talking to the ATF agent, this is a growing problem across the country. I don't know why we haven't heard more about it, but there's nothing illegal about making the fireworks. This gentleman had too much chemical stored in his house to be legal, but you can legally go online and buy it. There's nothing wrong with it. In Indiana, you have to have a permit to launch it, but you don't need a permit to make them or mix them or put them together for personal use. If you're selling it, it's a whole different issue but this was purely for personal use. Law enforcement did some more investigation. This gentleman was well known in his neighborhood for a very elaborate 4th of July fireworks show he did every year. And he would start making fireworks, according to his wife, on July 5th for the next year. So he spent the entire year making fireworks uh, for the following year. So a lot of what we saw in the basement, a lot of the packaging and the mortars that were stored in the totes was all stuff in preparation for the upcoming 4th of July. And so that was our our house explosion. We went through the whole gamut, rolled up thinking we had a natural gas explosion. The guys who first on scene said they smelled sulfur. And so as they were arriving, no fire, a sulfur-like odor in the air. So they that's, again, kind of pushed us down the avenue, a possible HME or something else going on, black powder, reloader. They didn't really know until they got down to the basement. In the basement, we also found a pile of uh, sulfur that was uncombusted. So it was, had fallen off the workbench when it blew up. So there was just a lot going on in those, those four to eight hours when we were trying to figure out what was really happening. That's my scenario. Do you guys have any questions for me? You guys have any questions? I've got people here with me live too. So my takeaway for you guys is please reach out ahead of time, talk to your partners. It really doesn't matter what the event is. If you're talking about an active shooter, possible bombing, uh, know what resources are in your community. If you wait till the event happens, every single after action, when you look at the bombings, you look at active shooters, uh, mass casualty incidents, uh, one of the things always identified is they didn't know their partners ahead of time. And that will make it so much easier if you know who to call, who has what resources. Not everybody has an extremely robust toolbox. And so knowing what your partners have working together can really le leverage all that information. Thank you again for visiting with me for this month's Threat of the Month. Everybody stay safe out there.